Our next speaker, speaker presenter is Philippe Allier. He is currently with the European Space Agency as a project controller. Uh, it should be noted though that this presentation is undertaken as a personal work, not necessarily endorsed as research activity by ESA. Also, he's a board member of, uh, a, as stated, UFO data, but we'll just say UAP data, <laughs> and is a project that advocates to utilize a large network of automated surveillance stations with sophisticated sensors to monitor the skies 24 seven, looking for aerial anomalies. In 2009, Philippe also founded the UAP observations reporting scheme project that collects UAP reports from the astronomical community. And with that, Philippe, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Ed, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, you won't have any problem to understand my French English, but I will try my best to be clear. So thanks uh, also to the organization and to the, um, the organizer of this session. So I think as a sixth and last speaker, and as a logical follow-up of the previous interventions, I will, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some concrete approaches now, which have, will have for objective to better detect, study, and characterize the UAP phenomena. And hopefully, uh, we'll be able to better predict such events in the future. Next slide, please. All right. Having said that, I would like to start my presentation by providing a few uh, points of general context. And I would like to underline the necessity of not only collecting UAP reports from trained observers like air crews, but also in acquiring instrumented data. And I think Ravi made uh, the point very clear at the beginning. Of course, we are all very pleased to observe since a few months, the favorable trends surrounding the UAP discourse, and we hope that this will facilitate in the future the reporting of sightings and encourage also a true scientific research. For sure, in order to make progress on learning more about the nature of UAP, there is the need to implement better data collection, not only in terms of enabling the reporting of serious observations like air crews, but also in engaging in instrumented approaches to acquire UAP data. So such reports and data absolutely necessary for the scientific community for engaging in research and learning about the physical characteristics of UAP. Overall, it's my opinion that different strategies and courses of actions need to be pursued in parallel in order to increase our chances of finding a solution to the UAP's challenge. Next, please. Concerning the aviation world and atmospheric science, should be reminded that scientists had previously not paid sufficient attention to eyewitnesses accounts, including airplane pilots, of some peculiar flashes or some giant flashes of light illuminating the sky above thunderstorms. And it is only at the end of 89 that some university researchers accidentally capture such natural phenomena, filming them on a low video camera. Since then, this research activity has really progressed to the point that a special instrument has been launched in 2018 to the International Space Station and is currently studying such phenomena from low orbit. The main point there is that I wish to make here is that air crews are good witnesses of unusual phenomena and they should be really encouraged to report their UAP observations as they could represent a new and important atmospheric phenomena like the sprites or something else. And I think the previous speaker also emphasized very well this point. Next, please. So about the UAP Task Force report, when I read it, I spotted the comments regarding the reticence to report UAP observations. This reminded me that in Europe, it was the same comment that was raised already 20 years ago within the Project Condign, which was a secret to force study undertaken by the British government's defense intelligence staff between 97 and 2000. It was a report that was released into, in, into the public domain in 2006. This project reports mentioned also there was evidence that airplane crews were seeing far more than they were reporting, 
due to the fear of ridicule or also the potential effect on company business. So like uh, the previous speaker, my important message today is that we are facing a stigma which exists since decades in the aviation world and that it's really time now to take concrete action for mitigating it. Obviously, the justification for encouraging UAP reports should be twofold. Firstly, maintaining or improving flight safety. And secondly, related to the part of the human intellectual curiosity, which seeks to extend our knowledge, leading potentially to new scientific discoveries, like in the example of the sprites. Once this topic is taken seriously, then science can move forward. Next, please. Now, I would like to propose the first important concrete action directly connected to the promotion of safe flight. I would recommend first that access is requested to a few selected aviation databases, the ones collecting information on safety incidents or special occurrence, and to extract UAP incidents and perform a thorough analysis. This would help understand better the UAP occurrences and guide future research. Different databases exist, and we could uh, start by uh, selecting a few of them, like the following ones. The FAA, which has an unmanned aircraft system database, allowed despite the difficulties that have been mentioned by the previous speaker. It will also be um, useful to add the NASA database that they maintain themselves called the Aviation Safety Reporting System. And of course, in order to complement that by uh, having a global perspective, we should consult existing relevant databases outside America. Canada would be a good choice via the Civil Aviation Daily Occurrence Reporting System, or CADORS. And in fact, a special request could be raised towards the private company, NAV Canada, for accessing the report themselves. Outside North America, the United Kingdom Civil Aviation Authority in a scheme called the Mandatory Occurrence Reporting could also be included. Also, in this UK case, access will only be possible via a special application justifying it by the objective of maintaining or improving aviator, aviation safety. Next, please. So it is obvious for all of that just the collection of good sighting reports and examining aviation database won't be sufficient. The only way to resolve this lack of understanding about UAP phenomenon is through serious scientific study. As mentioned today by Dr. Ravi, ultimately any new research will need to engage in collecting new data going forward. Such effort should lead to a systematic collection of credible and high-quality data. Alpha, this is a great challenge. There is also time for exiting new possibilities nowadays, and I would like to share with you now two positive developments. First, the, the, this scientific approach is much more durable than before. This is due to the rapid evolution in information and sensor technologies, in terms, for example, of availability of off-the-shelf scientific instrumentation, powerful computing sophisticated software, and ubiquitous high-speed internet access. All of this at a lower cost than before. And secondly, because I think that we have enough technologies available, but dedicated and expensive systems don't necessarily have to be built. Instead, we could rely on collecting UAP data through existing system. So I will now, for the rest of the presentation, talk about these two approaches, which in fact demonstrate that UAP can be studied with the tools of physical science. Next. To illustrate such approach, I would like to say a few words about field instrumented uh, missions. And I was glad that uh, the previous speaker mentioned the Hesdalen research. Since several, well, in fact, it's in several years, and not only in Norway, but also in Italy and uh, France and America, various civilians, associations, and few scientists attempt to detect and analyze UAP using scientific equipment and placed in the same geographical location from where UAP sightings have been reported. The project Hesdalen, located in a small Norwegian valley, is a leading example of such effort. In fact, this project represents the longest active field work as it started in 1984 and is still operational nowadays. The objective being to capture data across the electromagnetic spectrum, and therefore a wide range of equipment is deployed here, as illustrated on the side. On the slide, pardon. Despite the fact that these unexplained lights have appeared at random intervals, the project had obtained for the year several sexes of optical and radar detections. A few examples are shown. But another point that is uh, 
what we have to make clear is, uh, in fact, the objective of this project uh, by uh, Norwegian uh, scientists is to discover the physical mechanism causing the sphere of lights. And the few Norwegian researchers think that such knowledge, for example, could open the way to breakthrough technologies for lighting applications or energy sources. Next, please. So a second example that we should present is related to the US-based project called UFO Data that Ed has uh, mentioned and to which I participate. The project is not yet operational, but in fact, the important progress has recently been made with the building of the UAP monitoring station appearing in the picture on the side. Such said station is of course consisting of suite of instruments, which will be able to measure many characteristics of UAP as displayed, including visible and non-visible light spectrum, local environment factors, and others. The station will continuously run for 24 hours a day, and data will be recorded by most instruments only when an event will be detected. And of course, afterwards, several unique artificial intelligence capabilities will be used in order to reduce the false alarms. However, compared to SLL and the UFO data project will follow different strategies in order to increase the chances of collecting UAP data. Overall, the principle is to build the public science of UAP thanks to the deployment of a large international civilian network of automated surveillance station that will be connected to an event data server. Next, please. As I mentioned in the introduction, I believe that different strategies are needed in parallel and that there are already existing technologies that could contribute well to the UAP research. One promising new method that I would like to present to you relates to the use of civilian of observation satellites and associated data. After all, the single site where we can le learn the most about our planet is nowhere on Earth but high above it. The satellite images that are acquired on a continuous basis are powerful scientific tools to increase our knowledge of the environment. So one possibility is to use the civilians and governmental free open satellite data to mine for UFO data. In fact, this sounds not a very good concept, especially after I read the declaration of the former intelligent director who mentioned that UAP had been picked up by satellite imagery. And also, I have read with interest the latest FAQ from NASA, which makes a reference to search, search strategy now. So next part of the presentation, I will explain why I think this represents a potential promising uh, research method for detecting and collecting hard scientific data, but what could be a potential application and also some first ideas for databases extraction strategies. Next, please. So in order to realize the potential importance of uh, satellite technology for UAP, research, let me briefly recall the main advantage of the Earth Observation Satellites. In this case, I use the example of the two European Sentinel-2 high-resolution optical imager satellites, which are currently in orbit. So the satellite capture regularly on a regular, uh, regular basis the data. Second, they have an excellent precision, like up to a few meter resolutions. Third, they cover a very wide geographical zone, including areas very difficult to reach and several environments, and on a continuous basis. The archives of the satellites are kept, and mainly in order to see the environment, environmental trends over a long time. And uh, like in this case of these European uh, satellite, part of the Copernicus uh, um, program, this uh, satellite data access are free. So next, please. So in parallel of the uh, unique abilities of the uh, benefits of Earth observation satellites, should be mentioned that during the past years, technology and satellite companies offering to scientists have increased dramatically and the trend is going faster. The world observation data is rapidly changing due to two factors. On one hand, there's a huge increase of number of Earth observation satellite launched into orbit. And obvious, obviously this results in a massive increase of data collected. And on the other hand, also, there are many different actors that are entering the market with many new ideas to build and put in orbit full constellation of satellite with the objective to cover an image constantly and every day across the planet. So on the other hand, in parallel 
of this uh, huge increase of uh, Earth observation data, there is a very uh, uh, rapid advance in the field of artificial intelligence with now unprecedented capacities to retrieve and analyze, analyze all this collected data. So I think combining all the two together, I think this overall create an unprecedented opportunity for examining Earth observation satellite data to search for aerial anomalies, UAP, or unusual signatures. Next, please. So in order to illustrate uh, first this concept and the potential application, I will show you first some example of optical pictures taken by the Sentinel-2 Copernicus satellites. As you can see on the screen, the main point is that flying objects like airplanes can easily be observed on pictures as the satellites are even at an altitude of 780 kilometers. And the instrument is covering a wide swath of 290 kilometers wide. So the shape of the object, in that case, the plane is quite clear on the images. Next, please. The rainbow image is a composite product, in fact, combining three spectral bands of the satellite, which allows reconstructing a red, green, blue, false colored image. As I explained on this slide, this is in fact a single airplane, as the scaled color patterns for the moving airplane and the contrail is due, in fact, to the physical distance between the filters aboard the satellite. Next, please. The interesting thing, according to Moore, is that knowing the fixed attitude of a satellite and the physical distance between the different sensors on the instrument about the satellite allows to retrieve some relevant important parameters, like, for example, the size of the plane, which can be calculated in relation to the number of pixels on the image. The velocity and the altitude of the plane can also be derived via calculation. So to me, it seems that this could represent a potential application for UAP research as some new specific algorithm could be built for the detection of flying phenomena in satellite optical databases and for the extraction of potential area anomalies by applying some threshold of search parameters. For example, we could detect phenomena related to the observables that have been mentioned in a previous presentation in relation to peculiar shapes, observable structures, aspect ratios of the flying phenomena or pictured, uh, pictures at abnormal altitudes or reflecting some uh, abnormal velocity. So to make the link to the aviation databases, we could even think perhaps using satellites uh, data to first detect and characterize UAP that have had near misses with aircrafts. And even at the end, all what we have are optical photos, not spectral or any other data, this would already be a step forward, according to me. Next, please. So obviously, there will be the need to refine the algorithm searches in order to reduce the time to sift through huge Earth observation archives. At least now on this slide, some first uh, ideas that I had about spatial and time-based analysis methods that could be applied, and some logical ones, of course. And depending on how feasible and time consuming such extracting algorithm could be and applying artificial techniques like machine learning on them, we could, for example, going through some satellite optical archives and attempt to detect, as I said before, anomalies via threshold on some observables. Or we could try to retrieve data from the same date and location of specific credible UAP event, like uh, air crew sighting. This could be even an aviation report or a sighting that has been uh, identified in one of the uh, archives of the Serious Ethological Association's reporting systems. Or perhaps we could even systematically retrieve data for the same geographical area over a long stretch of time, like the Hesdal in Norway, or any location where there's suddenly an increase of uh, UAP activity, like uh, around the east and west coast of America. Also, uh, last, uh, per perhaps a good idea is we could target location and period during special events, maybe like during a special deployment of military force forces or training exercises, because apparently UAP activity seemed to increase during this period. Two minutes. Next, please. So in fact, we have reached the end of my uh, 
presentation and rather than uh, summarizing uh, what I just uh, told you, I think I would, like, uh, I would rather bring forward this three complementary point. So for sure, the UAP is a um, enduring mystery that has been going on for even over 70 years at least. And it has relevance as we see today that to the aviation, the military and a lot of citizens. So I think that today we have, uh, and compared to the past decades, we have uh, the technological capability to study it, and we have the opportunity to make progress. And uh, at this moment, as the last point, is the UAP uh, subject is gaining legitimacy, and the uh, stigma is uh, re being reduced. But now it's really the evolutionary responsibility of the scientific, scientific and professional community to engage in this research opportunity. Research, such research which is difficult requires proper funding and proper course of actions and strategies. Thank you. This will conclude my uh, presentation. Thank you. And in case of any question, I'll be happy to hear. And I hope everybody understood me. Thank you. Philippe, uh, thank you. And most engaging. And your points spoken quite well. Definitely in comparison with my ability to speak French <laughs> under the same set of topics. Uh, and I'm sure many share in that sentiment. So again, my, my sincere congratulations on that and appreciation. Now, let me uh, start off with uh, question and answers for Philippe. Please go ahead. Hi, Philippe. This is Christopher Plain, head science writer at The Debrief. Can you hear me okay? Very well, thank you. Great. You gave some uh, imaging and other examples of how satellite data might be used to add, uh, shed some light on the mystery. Is that a proposal to use satellites that are already in service and having them retasked? Or was this a proposal for satellites dedicated to this project? No, my proposal is, uh, as I said before, is uh, the tools already exist and it will, co it, does, it will cost too much to develop new specific system as a starting point, I would say. So we have to take advantage of what is available. And there's the possibility to use already highly calibrated and very effective uh, satellites uh, instruments. So we should do, take advantage of them. And in that case, there are some several databases that are already available for free. Of course, we can also contact uh, uh, specific uh, satellite uh, private companies who also have archives in order they would help, but then we need to pay them. But in, so I don't, I don't advocate for building a satellite and mm -hmm. launching a satellite dedicated to UAP detection. Although maybe a very small satellite could be down. So you're recommending uh, both uh, utilizing the databases of information that are already captured and stored yes. from existing satellites, as well as potentially tasking them to specific events. Uh, uh, um, maybe I was not clear enough. I, I think we have to build up algorithms to retrieve the data from the existing satellite existing data. Databases. Existing okay, databases. Now, because uh, the next step is much more expensive and you will need uh, uh, much more uh, expertise and technical abilities, time and money. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, hi, Philippe. Hi. Uh, hello? Hello. Yeah, I hear okay. You. Okay, great. Um, uh, really fascinating talk. Uh, thank you. Um, I was curious about the Sentinel-2 ESA satellite uh, and, and what specifically uh, is, is kind of the uh, technical reason for um, the satellite uh, doing these Earth observation images from three different spectral bands over time, over the course of its orbit. Uh, so, yeah. I'm curious so, to know just yes. why it's already doing that. The uh, Sentinel-2 and with the opt an optical instrumentation was devoted to uh, the analysis of the 
vegetation, in fact, especially for helping uh, crops and to uh, how, do you, how do you say that to uh, understand the the situation, the health status of the crops? So it's for agricultural reasons on the ground because they can detect through the different instruments how dry is the ground, if you need water, and if you uh, what is the health status? If you need to put more products in order to make it uh, to uh, improve the uh, crops production. So it was mostly for uh, this kind of uh, the nature of this uh, uh, agriculture and uh, for feeding uh, people basically at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah, increase the um, capacity. So, so with the uh, airplane and the contrail, is the fact that this is like a very white, bright object that's reflecting the entirety, the reason yeah. that it's producing this effect? Alors, if I may compare, in the past, we had these spy satellites or these defense satellites, and they were taking just pictures above specific points or specific time. Now the satellites are evolving in a kind of following a carpet mode picture. They acquire continuously picture across this swath. So you have a huge amount of data. And of course, when they pass across areas, they will take a picture of anything that is in between. So right. my idea is, uh, I mean, we could use this opportunity to try to uh, progress in the field. Of course, the satellite is not uh, dedicated to this kind of uh, survey, but the advantage is they are there. You don't need to develop an instrumentation and the data normally is available. The, what needs to be done is the building up of the specific algorithms and retrieving your data and analysis. Understood. Uh, thank you.